Hello, everyone. Let's begin with some questions. If you will, please ask yourself, what would it mean to you and your organization if you could leave this session with a better idea of how to sell, hire, or engage any important stakeholder audience for your organization's success? What if I told you that you already have what you need to do this? And what if I told you that this was all about your organization's story and not your brand? And what if I told you that there were heroes in your organization who are driving your organization's story and can help you as a leader to bring your story to life in ways that will help you better engage all of these stakeholder audiences. Let's consider these four words. Once upon a time, I've got a little exercise for you here. Close your eyes, you're on a webinar, nobody can see you. Once upon a time, what pictures do these four words bring to your mind? Once upon a time, what voice do you hear in your head? Once upon a time, what experiences in your life do those words bring back to you? Once upon a time. Okay, you can open your eyes now. If you don't mind, please, you should see a chat pane to the right of your screen. And I'd like to ask, that you put a favorite once upon a time story in the chat pane. So when you think of once upon a time and the pictures or the voice that you hear or the experiences that come back for you, what story pops to mind? I'll tell you, for me, the story that pops to mind is Good Night Moon. I've got uh, a blog coming out on Forbes.com pretty soon, and I've got a link in there to the top 25 most popular bedtime stories of all time. And I will tell you that uh, Goodnight Moon is in there. I see we've got the Princess Bride in here. I like the Princess Bride. I, I think that's a, that's a great one. Rapunzel. Anything Disney. Yes, yes. Disney, what great storytellers, right? The Never Ending Story, another great choice. Wow, keep them coming there. I really appreciate you doing that. So, you know, Deathly Hollows, that's a good one too. <laughs> you know, we can see by the chat here that most of us have experienced great storytelling at some point in our lives. And, and really for a lot of us, it begins very early in life. And there's reasons for that that we're going to explore today in the next several minutes. All right, so before we dig into the power of story and what it can do for your organization, I'd like you to ask yourself, why are you here? Meaning, why are you in this particular session? Now, to make this session as useful as possible, asking yourself that question now ought to help you prepare some questions for me later on, because we will have a question and answer session around the bottom of, of the hour uh, after the presentation itself. So what brought me here? Well, I have an absolute passion for the power of stories. I spent about two decades in journalism before I got into the agency world, and I figured it out one time. Over a 20-year career, I wrote more than 10,000 stories. As an editor, I edited another 10,000 stories. And you know, that's really a lot of beginnings and middles and ends and heroes and villains. I really, really learned a lot about the power of storytelling for my career in journalism. Today, you're gonna to learn about your organization's most powerful marketing asset, what we call the capital S story. And you'll learn how to find the heroes in your organization that make that story so powerful. 
when we're done with this session, you'll leave with some resources that we hope will enable you to go back to your organization, work with your colleagues, work with your peers, work with your C-suite, and start to uncover, develop, and share your most important marketing asset. You might ask yourself, and so many people are, are talking about it these days, why are stories so important? Well, let's start with this. This is the challenge that we face as leaders today. I love this image. It's an artwork created by an artist named Nadia Colonzo Lorenz. A few years ago, she was the distinguished artist in residence at Grand Valley State University in Michigan. It's nine feet long. It should be nine feet high, 45 feet long. It's called Comfortably Numb, and it's her depiction of today's communication overload. It's constructed of magazines, newspapers, and video images, and I think it really gives you a true picture of the clutter we face every day as leaders when we're trying to communicate internally, externally, whatever the stakeholder audience, this is what we face. And the stat at the bottom is a little bit dated, but it's relevant. It's from a 2011 USC study. It's only gotten worse since then. The amount of information that we're bombarded with on a daily basis is just crazy. So why are stories such a great way of communicating? Because at its essence, our old brain, the brain that we share with many other mammals and creatures in this great earth is driven by storytelling. Researchers really do call this our old brain. It's the part that you might know better as controlling fight or flight. So why does the old brain like stories? Well, because the old brain or the brain itself is the world's original energy saving appliance. What do I mean by that? Your brain only constitutes about 3% of your body weight, but it consumes 23% of your body's energy. The old brain uses these stimuli that you see on the screen to tell our brain when to turn on, when to turn off, when to speed up, when to slow down. So the old brain is the part of the brain that tells college kids to fall asleep in the middle of boring lectures. The old brain is the part of your brain that tells people to stand up and applaud at the end of an overly long, boring political speech. Of the six stimuli here, all of them are activated by stories, but in particular, great stories are tangible, they're memorable, and they're emotional drivers. Don't take my word for it. Here are some quotes that I pulled together for you about the power of stories. This is a means of connecting that old brain with today's environment and what we do as leaders. You know, for two decades, the buzzword in marketing has been brand. And what we've learned in our work at our firm is that your organization's story, why someone would wanna work for you, buy from you, invest in you, partner with you, is most important, far more important than any logo or colors or tagline that you may use. In fact, to break through the information clutter and connect with your stakeholders, your story should drive your brand. In too many organizations today, and I'm sure many of you can think of some examples on your own, the brand is disconnected from the story. Some cute advertising campaign, and you think to yourself, that doesn't really describe the organization that I know that goes by that name. This is why we believe your story should come first. If you're a leader, you need to deliver results. Stories deliver results because they're memorable, they're timeless, great stories transcend culture, and great stories create great two-way communication. Stories don't require any explanation. The best stories 
are understood regardless of language. If I say to you that something is a David and Goliath story, you don't have to be a biblical scholar to understand that it's the underdog fighting the big giant. These kinds of stories connect with today's audiences because they don't require explanation. And as we talked about a few minutes ago, the audiences that we most need to reach internally or externally are overwhelmed by digital clutter and information. They need to make sense of things. So let me give you an example. In a dim corner of the St. Anthony Club, a landmark San Antonio bar, a CEO and his lawyer huddled over drinks. The dark surroundings matched the mood. The CEO was folding his company and the lawyer was there to help. Despite the dark bar and circumstances, the CEO could see a brighter future. Herb, he said, I have an idea for another company. And then he leaned forward and began to sketch a triangle on a cocktail napkin. His pen scratched the words Dallas, then San Antonio, and finally Houston on each point of the triangle. The lawyer studied the napkin and nodded. Maybe you've heard this story before. Maybe you haven't. My colleague Aaron right now is going to do a little poll here and we'll see if this memorable story is one that you recall. So take a look in the chat pane there. You should have an opportunity to provide an answer. Keep them coming, folks. Great stuff, and thank you for participating. I'm going to give it just another minute here. All right, looks like everybody who's wanted to participate has. And I have to say, the overwhelming 90% choice is Southwest Airlines, which is 100% correct. This is a story that was told many times by the uh, founders of Southwest Airlines, is how the company was founded. Uh, later on, some folks said that it was a made-up story. Regardless, I, I like the story. Uh, and as I said, it was, it was shared many times. The CEO in the story was a fellow named Roland King. Most of us don't know, remember who he was, but we do remember the lawyer. His name is Herb Kelleher. And Herb went from being the lawyer to being the CEO who is most credited with turning Southwest Airlines into the successful organization that it is today. So the Southwest example illustrates a principle in the business world that there are stories, small s, and stories, capital S. Those that stand the test of time, ones that are repeated and remembered and taught in business schools. Now, Steve Jobs founded Apple, Bill Gates founded Microsoft. I like both companies. This is not about the companies. This is about the difference between a narrative that is a capital S narrative and one that is a small s narrative. You know, a small s narrative is a press release. A big s is something like Steve Jobs. Why is it that though both of these gentlemen are great leaders, that we get books and movies about Steve Jobs? And why does that matter to you as a leader if you have a business or an organization that you want somebody else to know about? I've hinted at this in uh, the several minutes that have come before this, the capital S story. Your capital S story answers these questions. Why someone would buy from you, work for you, invest in you, partner with you, depending upon what your organization does. Uh, maybe why someone would be happy being your neighbor. This is the fundamental story that rises above all the others. We've learned in our work at our firm that every organization has at least one capital S story, although far too often it's hidden or forgotten in the ways that the organization communicates with the world. 
a capitalist story does several things and they they change over time uh, you think of your organization's story like a book if you're a startup you might be in chapter one if you're a fortune 500 or fortune 50 company you might be in chapter 20. so there are different kinds of stories that comprise the capital s story over time it depends on where the organization is and its journey so i've given you some examples here these are very common these five here <clears throat> it might be your origin story it might be something about the dream or the passion that's driving the organization it might be about something that's been invented a service or a product it might be about the organization coming of age either because of a product or the organization itself or some service it might be that epiphany that aha moment there are other kinds of capital s stories too these are just some examples the bottom line is your capital s story describes your reason for being and we're going to give you some handouts today that we're going to go over in a few minutes and it'll be available to you if you're watching this on replay uh, via email that'll walk you through this process so that you can do this in your own organization. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that in addition to every organization having at least one capital S story, it also has a hero. So let me share with you a hero story. The inspiration hit Bill Bowerman one morning over a plate of waffles in the kitchen of his Oregon home. Staring at the syrup that was filling the depressions of his breakfast food, Bowerman saw something that no one else had. What if he could create something with a waffle iron that solved his greatest problem, creating world-class shoes for his runners? Bowerman stepped into his kitchen over and over again in the summer of 1970, pouring urethane into his wife's waffle iron instead of pancake batter. He wasn't the first man to ruin the kitchen appliance, but he might be the most famous. Today we know Bowerman's story and company and its legendary CEO far better than we know Bowerman, sadly. But without Bill Bowerman, Nike wouldn't exist. And we might not know Phil Knight, who met Bowerman while Knight was a distance runner at the University of Oregon and ran for Bowerman on his track team. What you see here on the screen is one of the destroyed waffle irons that came from the Bowerman home. It now has a place of honor in the uh, Nike Museum in Oregon. Now you may be saying to yourself, we've talked about Southwest, we've talked about Nike so far, we've talked about Herb Kelleher, we've talked about Phil Knight. My organization is not Nike. My organization is not Southwest. That's okay. Only one organization has your organization's story, yours. You are not trying to be Nike. You are not trying to be Southwest. And quite frankly, many of the failures that we see in branding come because organizations look at companies like that and say, I want to be just like them. You don't want to be just like them. You want to be yourself. And a critical measure of doing that is focusing on the heroes in your organization. What you see on the screen here is our distillation of the 12 most common archetypes that you'll see used by brands. So these can represent founders, inventors, CEOs, people making things or people delivering services. They're heroes because they embody the meaning of your organization's capital S story. Those you see here are a direct connection to the old brain and better communication results. Remember David and Goliath that I talked about earlier? So David's the classic underdog, right? And you can find David on the archetype wheel here if you'd like. I'll give you a couple of examples of some that pop to mind right away. Luke Skywalker, classic hero. Merlin the Magician, wizard in the business world, a company like Lego, creator. Think of all the wonderful things that people have been able to do with those blocks. I mean, they even have theme parks dedicated to Lego. Amazing what they've done with their creativity. 
Now, how does this work for you? We just talked about archetypes. You align those with the people in your organization and your story. Capitalized stories of great organizations align tightly with the archetypal narrative. And in these stories, the organization's people become the heroes and the stakeholder audiences that you're most trying to reach join the party or the parade. They want to be part of your story. You don't have to be big or famous for this to work. What we're going to do now is we're going to dig into this and I'm going to share with you a few tools so that you can follow along and I'll walk you through some of the thinking that has been produced by our experience in this area. In the end, the story that's most important is the one that defines your organization. So we're going to test our technology here, offer you the opportunity to download this worksheet that you see on the screen. My colleague Aaron is going to put a pop-up on your screen. I see it on my screen. I hope you do too, folks. And you should be able to download the PDF. If you're having any problems with that, please let us know, and we'll do what we can to help you with that. For those of you who are watching this webinar later on a replay, these resources will be sent to you as a follow-up to the event. So it looks like we're getting a fair number of people uh, downloading those. I'll wait just a minute here. Okay, looks like a fair number of folks have downloaded these, and uh, if you haven't, you can always go back and do that. What you've got now on your computer is what we call our capital S story worksheet. It's an idea starter for you and your team to better understand your capital S story. And you can see that the questions that to us are answered by the capital S story appear here on the worksheet. What we recommend is that you work through the sections of this with your team, your peers, maybe your C-suite in a small group setting. Frequently what we find when we work with our clients is that the understanding of a, an organization's capital S story may be different among different members of the group. This kind of a session using a tool like this is a great way to tease out every important aspect of your organization's most important marketing asset, its capital S story. And then you can build consensus and put together the strongest possible narrative that describes the true nature of your organization and the value that you bring to those who engage with you. Very simple and straightforward. Now, Aaron is watching the chat, and if anybody has any questions, please feel free to pop them out there. I'm gonna move on here in a minute and we're gonna take a look at another tool that you can use after this webinar. But I'm happy to answer questions along the way. And if you'd rather wait till the end, we're not far from the end of the formal presentation and you can ask questions then as well. Capitalist story, heroes. So we're gonna take a look at another tool now that'll help you identify your organization's heroes. Once again, in the uh, chat pane, Aaron is going to put in a pop-up. I'm seeing it on my screen. I hope you are as well. This is our hero worksheet. It's designed to help you identify the folks in your organization who best embody your capital S story. The previous handout is one-sided, one piece of paper, basically. This is uh, two sides of paper, basically. What we've got on the front, and this is based upon our experience in working with clients, as an exercise to kind of work your small group through it to help them understand how companies, organizations, can represent different archetypes in their capital S story. And then on the second page at the top there, what we've also got is an area where as a small group, you can work together 
and come up with your own answers on some companies and what archetypes they might represent. Finally, at the bottom, there's a section there where you can start to work through the archetype that best describes your organization. Once again, if you have any issues with this, let us know in the chat pane and we'll do our best to address them. The goal here is to give you some tools that you can take back to your organization and start to tease out this story. The best stories are collaboratively uncovered by the people most important to sharing that story. And then they're developed. And then you go to the marketplace of ideas and develop your brand and develop your marketing plan and develop your strategies and decide what tactics are the best way to share that story. But what's the point of all this? We like to say that if you're investing even a single dollar in marketing, you should know what you're getting for it. And the point of uncovering, developing, and sharing your capital S story is to deliver the kind of happy ending that your organization seeks. What you got here on the screen now is a picture of Bill Bowerman on the left and Phil Knight on the right. When you think about an organization like Nike, the story of Nike is about far more than the swoosh. It's about Bill. It's about Phil. It's about the ability to take weekend warriors like probably most of us participating in this webinar and align us as weekend warriors with world-class athletes who represent the Nike brand. It makes us part of the story. And really, without the story, what is the brand? Why would people pay more for a piece of clothing or a keychain or whatever that has the swoosh on it? It could be exactly the same as one on the next counter that doesn't have the swoosh on it. It's about the story, and that story drives the Nike brand. That's what you can do for your own organization by uncovering and developing and then sharing your capital S story. To recap where we kind of started today, why stories? Because stories deliver results. They're memorable. They're timeless. Great stories transcend culture. They produce great two-way communication. And of all the stories you can share, your capital S story is the one that is the most valuable. This here is a picture of Rollin King and Herb Kelleher from Southwest. So we hope that having spent some time with us today and worked with worked hard to leave some time for questions and answers, uh, that you've got an idea of the power of story and the capital S story. We've given you a couple of takeaways so that you can start to take a look at this uh, in your own organization and maybe have a conversation with your colleagues or your peers or your boss about the capital S story and why it's important in your brand and your marketing and your communications. I like the statistic because really it's about stories. <laughs> After presentation, 63% of attendees remember stories. I shared a couple of iconic stories today. I hope you remember those. I hope we got you thinking about your own story and its importance. Thank you. Appreciate your participation and attention in the session. At this point, we're ready to answer some questions you're gonna get the uh, PDF of the deck as well, and you'll be able to learn more about my book, which uh, came out a few months ago, that talks about this more in depth. There'll be hot links there, and certainly if you wanna have a further conversation with us, you'll be able to do that by clicking on some of the links in the deck here. All right, with that, Aaron, let's get to the questions. All right, uh, well, thanks, Paul. Um, and as Paul mentioned, of course, if you have questions, even during the Q&A, feel free to enter it in that chat and, and we'll try to get to them during the Q&A session. All right, uh, so first question here. 
I feel like our company's biggest problem is that we all explain what we do a little differently and our services are so complex. It's really hard to explain. Uh, where can we start to fix this? And you know, I think to add a little bit of commentary here, I think a lot of B2B companies probably experience this often. So curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks, Aaron. So at WordWrite, we typically work with providers of complex services who are trying to reach C-suite decision makers and middle market companies. So a lot of times, you know, architecture firms, accounting firms, law firms, uh, financial companies. So we understand the, the B2B aspects of this very well. And it's sort of an inverse relationship. The more complex your product or service, the more you need a simple and strategic story. And what we did by sharing a couple of tools with you today is gave you a little bit of a peek into the process we use to deal with the answer to this question. We begin our story crafting engagements and story crafting is the name of our trademark service that we use to uncover your capital S story. We begin that with a meeting of all the most important folks who uh, will be shaping or sharing the capital S story. And that's where this gets teased out. You know, one VP might say, oh, I thought our story was this. Another VP would say it's this. And we facilitate that conversation. What we find is bringing everybody together and pulling those different aspects of the narrative together really creates a stronger story. All right, thanks, Paul. Um, so once we determine our archetype, how do you recommend infusing that into our branding and messaging? I think that kind of process can be abstract to people just coming into this brand new. So let me tell you a story. One of our clients that we did this for is an accounting firm. And the archetype that we identified for them uh, is the sage. So the sage is kind of like Merlin that I talked about earlier. It's a wise one. And this particular accounting firm operates in a very specialized arena of counting, accounting. So specialized that there was a conference not too many years ago, and the keynote speaker was supposed to be a person running a federal government program for this audience. And he got sick at the last minute, and the organizers called the head of this accounting firm and said, hey, the guy from the government can't come, so you're our second choice. I mean, wow, that's a safe, right? Somebody who's that respected. Now, this is an accounting firm, it's people by accountants. who are They're great clients, they're lovely people. Accountants do not walk the face of the earth saying, hi, I'm Paul, I'm a sage. That's not how this works. The idea of your archetype is infused in ways that are relevant to what you do as an organization. So for this client, we went all the way through a rebranding process that included a tagline, a higher grade of accounting. So you can see that Sage is the engine under the hood, you know, but very few people buy a car for the engine under the hood, right? Most people buy that car for other reasons. Very few people buy accounting because their archetype is the Sage, although they certainly want a Sage if they operate in a complex accounting environment with strong federal regulation, right? So that's an example of how we infuse that. In our process, we'll take something like the SAGE and then we will align that with the business that the organization is in and develop what we call story anchors initially. And that allows us to say, okay, you're a SAGE and that would mean you talk about yourself in these three or five ways. And then we build that out into a full brand and marketing platform to share the story. All right, great. Thanks, Paul. Um, what are some warning signs that may show that our story isn't resonating with our target audience? So what, what are some of those indicators? It's a great question. There's two aspects to this. If it's difficult for people inside the organization, especially the leaders, to agree on the most important differentiator for your organization, that's a warning sign. In a similar fashion, if people outside the organization can't really articulate 
the unique value of your organization. That too is a warning sign. And it's for this reason that in our story crafting process, we use uh, techniques and processes like I described with the leadership group, getting everybody together to settle on, on the narrative. And we do the same thing early on in the story crafting process by taking a look at the market that your organization inhabits. And we use uh, tools such as uh, one of them is called the five burning questions. What are the five most important questions you need to answer about your organization as it lives in the marketplace of ideas where you operate, you know, such as who are your competitors? What market share do you have? Uh, what unique value do you bring to the marketplace you serve? And again, it's interesting that frequently there's not a consensus or a majority agreement on what that is. And that's critical to get before you start spending money on marketing. Folks, one of our values is don't spend a single dollar on marketing unless you know what you're going to get for it. And far too often what we see is people are spending a lot of money on tactical execution and marketing that is not helping them differentiate themselves from their competitors. It's not helping them build deeper relationships with the stakeholder audiences that they most need to reach. As well. Um... So another question that just came in here, what if your story evolves? How do you handle a transition in your story? That is another great question. And this is natural. Again, you know, think of the story of your organization like a book with, with chapters. If you're a tech company, the first chapter might be all about the idea. And the second chapter might be about bringing it to market. And the third chapter might be about a partnership or professionalizing the organization uh, by bringing in a CEO, you know, maybe who had success at another company. Those, those are just examples. Um, in a COVID environment, the capitalist story of an organization, a chapter that would be relevant uh, to the times we're in right now might be how you handled COVID. Maybe your organization learned something from your COVID experience that caused you to evolve your story and maybe move in a little bit different direction. Those are some examples of how it works. Again, think of it a book with chapters rather than a story that's chiseled in stone and never changes over time. Great, excellent. Um, as a B2B business, what are some ways that we can tell human interest stories that stick? So, one of the reasons why we focus on, on what we call the heroes in the organization is because people buy from people. Even when it's a large committee-driven B2B decision, it's people connecting with people. Even in a COVID environment where it's video, Zoom, whatever the platform is, it's people connecting with people. It's people making decisions. And as we talked about at the beginning of the webinar today, what folks respond to is stories. We're constantly telling ourselves stories all day long. Why is traffic backed up on, on, on my way to wherever it is I'm going? Why is it that uh, my neighbor got COVID and I didn't? You know, any, any sort of a, an event that you can think of that's happening in your personal and professional life, our brain is wired to continually tell ourselves stories. And when you're in a large, and this happens with a lot of our clients, they'll be in a large RFP process or they'll be in a process where there's several firms. You know, there are table stakes. If you're hiring an outside law firm, well, duh, everybody has a law degree, that's a table stake. You know, they've got certifications, that's a table stake. What the potential client wants to know is how are you different? And the best differentiator is the story of the organization. What is it about the organization that is uniquely different? We're currently working with a, a law firm and we're engaged in this process. And the archetype we've developed for them is kind of a combination of a few archetypes, which is common. They're legal pathfinders. And the, the reason why they are is their clients typically hire them to navigate legal situations that they've either never been in themselves or they just plain don't know how to navigate. So that's how they're going to differentiate themselves. They're going to talk about their experience, their knowledge, 
they, they've already been there. They're, they're, they're explorers, they're guides. They can help you as a client find the right path. This came in. Uh, what do you recommend as far as connecting your story to the quote unquote bottom line? So, as I said a couple of times already, you shouldn't spend a single dollar on marketing unless you know what it's going to do for you. And there's a lot of research that shows your story is, as I've said, your most valuable marketing asset. It's the thing that people are most going to remember about you. We live in this era in which you can measure practically anything. It's rare that we as a firm will develop an organization's story and then go out to share it and not include a rather beefy digital presence. Everything you do on the internet can be measured. So for us, it's critically important that once we uncover and develop a story, that as we're sharing it, we are measuring it along the way. There's three principles that guide us when we're developing a capital S story. First, that it's authentic, meaning that it's rooted in truth. Second, that fluent storytellers are sharing it. And third, and this directly answers the question, is that you're continually reading the audience to make sure that they're engaged. You know, you don't wanna be throwing money at things and just spending money out there if nobody's engaged. And, and critically, we believe that there needs to be two-way engagement. You know, your conversations and marketing should not go like a joke that a friend of mine have. Uh, but enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? And unfortunately, too much classic advertising, and I have a whole chapter in the book about this, is just buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. And that's not the way great storytelling works. The audience needs to be engaged. Early on in the book, I have a chapter that describes an experiment that was done at Princeton University where a young woman told a story and they had dozens of students listen to the story inside a functional MRI machine and they wired these folks up. When the woman told the story, they knew what her brain did. When folks listened to the story, they knew what their brains did. Guess what? Listening to that great story, their brains reacted in the same way that the storyteller's brain reacted. And that's a very basic science way of saying you have to measure whether or not your story's resonating. There's a million ways to do that. I won't go into all of them today, but we believe it's critically important. You can't say marketing or PR or whatever is sort of a foo-foo exercise that can't be measured because that is just dead wrong. All right. Well, actually, this is a, a great uh, segue here. Um, question that just came in. I like what you shared today, and I understand it as a marketing professional, but I feel it's going to be challenging to convince my senior leadership team that this is something they need. How should I go about recommending this to them? So, you know, I think a lot of our, our clients experience this. How, how do I engage my executive leadership team in this effort? That's a great question question. Number one, uh, certainly when you get the deck, there's a number of resources that you, you can share. And by the way, we find this is true, particularly in B2B environments. Uh, making this kind of a decision is, for lack of a better term, a committee decision. And there's always going to be people who are more interested in it than others. We're all about the science here. The folks who run a lot of the client organizations we work with, lawyers, accountants, architects, they are not artists per se. They are, you know, the left brain thinkers who are very interested in numbers in the bottom line. And I'm here to tell you today that the resources that we've got here on the screen and that you can find on our website are designed, the book itself is designed to address those considerations. Great storytelling, your capital S story, is not BS, it's biology. That's why you want to focus on your story. Most C-suite leaders are incentivized. In fact, the, it's a job requirement to deliver results. Nothing is going to deliver better results than sharing your capital S story, and science proves it. Hope that answers the question. If not, follow up with me later, and I'd be glad to help. 
Um, all right, well, I have a logo and a tagline. Isn't that my brand story, Paul? Why wouldn't that be considered your brand story alone? It's not. It is, you know, the, the title of the book is Finding Your Capitalist Story and Why Your Story Drives Your Brand. Again, what is, what is the Nike swoosh without the story of Nike? It's an interesting sort of graphic element, but it's the story behind Nike that provides the value of the logo. And as I said earlier, you know, some of the most epic fails in branding have occurred when a lot of money has been invested in doing something cute or creative or innovative, but it doesn't really align with the true nature of the organization. And that's why that's not your story. Your story answers those very specific questions that I provided. Why should I buy from you is not answered by, because I like the swoosh logo. Um, it's not answered by, you know, I like the name Southwest. And uh, I guarantee you it's not answered by, I like the green in your logo or whatever. It's answered by the nature and character of your organization, which we call your capitalist story. here um, you've talked a lot about different things that can be considered stories what about something as simple as a social media post how could that be considered a story well it absolutely can be and uh, I have a chapter in the book that's all about storytelling and social media and I've got an example in that chapter that I'll, I'll share with everybody today um, there was a scientist um, who couldn't sleep and he's actually a climate scientist, but he likes foxes for whatever reason. I don't know. So he couldn't sleep this one night, and he decided that to, since he was awake anyway, that he was going to do one tweet for every unusual fox in the world that he found. And it started a snowball of interest on Twitter because he was funny, and it was witty, and it was short, and he had a picture of each fox wound up being stories on CNN, Time Magazine, et cetera, et cetera, about this. So social media is actually a great place for storytelling. And certainly video storytelling, we've now got multiple platforms beyond YouTube, which is, of course, the oldest video storytelling platform in the social media universe. Uh, Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat. So you can do a lot of great storytelling on social media. And sometimes even without even needing any words, I, I talk in the book about some of my favorite uh, stories and uh, um, that don't even have words, you know, and it's a great way to, to do storytelling. Well, um, and thank you everyone. That's all the time we have for today. Uh, but thank you for joining and for your great questions. As I mentioned at the beginning, all of these materials are going to be shared with you in a follow-up uh, email, and Paul mentioned that we'll be sharing the slide deck as well in that email, so keep an eye out for that. Um, we'll also be including a recording of the session, so you're welcome to access this at any point on demand. So thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Take care, everyone. Thanks, folks.